In our Bible reading today we are going to read Luke chapter 7 verses 1 to 10 page number 1035 the faith of the centurion when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening he entered Capernaum there a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was ill and about to die the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you to come, come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself, I am, I am a man under authority, with the soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I Say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Amen. Well, I want to start this morning by talking about John Wesley. At least a bit about his upbringing. Of course, his father was Samuel Wesley, a very strict man. He, he, was never, he was never wrong. He was, all, he was always right in his opinion. And he insisted on his wife calling Susanna, calling him my Lord. That's how she had to address him. And he was very much what was considered high church in those days, very high church. And he brought his sons up, sons up to be the same. Because there were three sons, there was actually another son called Samuel who went on to be a school teacher. Now the belief of high church people at the time was salvation was some, something that had to be worked at, it had to be earned, it was a, a life of an austere living. And Samuel, to be fair, he wasn't a, a hypocrite in that way, he lived up to that, uh, to that uh, idea of an, an austere lifestyle. But also... Also, he believed that um, salvation was only found in the Church of England. That was his, that was his thinking, and that that's what that's what he taught. And he was anybody that wasn't in the that was another denomination. Well, he he would have nothing to do with them at all. And that was a common thinking that the high church thinking at the time was common across this country, and it, its influence spread to the in, great institutions like Oxford University when. John and Charles went, you had to be in the Church of England to get there. To, to, if, if you were of another denomination, you, well, you just won't be allowed in. Even after their conversion, the Wesleys and Whitfield as well still held to that idea for a while. Although they changed, started changing their attitude towards this, what was called dissent as people of another denomination believing that they should win them over to the true church by love. Now, I don't think Samuel Wesley would approve love. No. But they, they started to change. The first person to noticeably change his position was George Whitfield while he was in America. Now, George Whitfield, um, he was actually minister at um, Savannah in Georgia. But while he was there, he never stayed at George. He was up and down America on a preaching tours. He went six times in those old boats to America. I think he was shipwrecked once off the coast of Ireland. I don't know how he ever made it on those boats. But um, anyway, he would go up and down America on a preaching tour. Now, America in them days was the eastern sea colonies on the eastern seaboard. So he'd be up one side and back down. But as he passed through, he had to go through Charleston in South Carolina. And there he met who was to become one of his most prominent enemies, the Reverend Garden. 
I don't remember his first name, so you'll just have to do his surname at the moment. And he objected to George Whitfield. He objected to him. First of all, he was preaching about he, he himself. It was a bit like Samuel Wesley. He was very much a high churchman. And uh, George Whitfield's going around saying, you must be born again. As well as that, he, when he preached in the open air, something else he didn't like, people, Baptists and other denominations were going to listen to him. And he was friendly towards them. He didn't chase them away. He was friendly towards them. So this was far too much. And um, every time he went to Charleston, he would, off, he would ask to preach in the Anglican church, and it was met with stern refusal. Uh, so being a true Anglican, before he preached in the afternoon in the open air, he would attend morning worship. But the first twice that he did it, the Reverend Garden spent the whole sermon personally attacking him and his beliefs. So the third time he went there, he said, well, I'm not doing this anymore. So he, he preached in the open air in the morning and he told his people, don't go to that church. You won't find the gospel there. Go instead to the Baptists or the Independents or anybody else because that's where you'll find the gospel. Now, for an Anglican minister at the time, this was unthinkable. But what he'd come to realise, and the Wesleys came to realise it afterwards, what the true church is. So what is the true church? Well, it crosses all denominational lines. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose on the third day, and that his sacrifice is the only salvation that scripture offers, and that God sends his Holy Spirit to live within us, and that one day Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. If that's you, we are the church. If we continue to hold to these words. At the time of Jesus, the attitude that many Jews had towards Gentiles was in many ways similar to the attitude that Samuel Wesley had towards those that were not in the Anglican church. If you wonder about Gentiles, I mean, most of you probably know what Gent Gentile is, non-Jewish people. Probably people like us, we, be, we would be considered Gentiles. But to many Jews at the time, Gentiles were outside of God's love. They were sinners, unclean, as bad as tax collectors. Yes, there were one or two that they, they would tolerate, that looked to, looked to the God of the Bible, that were referred to as God-fearers. But even these people, god fearers when they went to the temple to worship at Jerusalem, they would only be allowed in the outer courts, the far outer courts. The inner courts were for Jewish men only. Now it is true that, that the Jews were God's chosen people and that salvation came from the line of David. But God's salvation was not meant to stay forever with the Jews only. God is the God of all people. Scripture says so. The Old Testament says it. Isaiah chapter 49, God will restore Israel and make them a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. So God's salvation starts with the nation of Israel, but it's to reach the ends of the earth. It's reached North Korea. It's reached Pakistan, even though the, the enemies of the gospel are trying to stamp it out, it's reached those areas. Some Jews understood it. Simeon, when he blesses the baby Jesus at the temple, he says, this sovereign Lord, as you promise you may dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. So Simeon understood it, he got it. Our God is the God of all nations. Which brings us to the centurion in this passage. A Gentile and a God-fearer. According to the commentaries, and I've read a few commentaries on this, he was probably not a Roman soldier, but part of the army of Ant Herod Antipas. Now this is suggested because of his knowledge of the religion of the Jews and his love for it. And he, in Galilee, there was quite a number of Gentiles. Now, Herod, this is one of the six Herods of the, the Bible, of the New Testament. Herod ruled Galilee 
course, the Romans ruled it really, but he wrote, he ruled it in in you know he was under them. He ruled it for them, and he would be allowed his own army to help police the area and help with customs. And as long as they kept the peace and taxes kept flowing, the Romans were very happy with this situation. Didn't matter that Herod was not the nicest of men; the Romans weren't bothered as long as, as long as. There was peace and taxes. They, they, were, they were happy with that. And as well in his own army, it was known that he preferred Gentiles to Jews. Probably because in case there was an uprising, he'd be worried of what side the Jews would come down on. So he, would, he, preferred, he preferred Gentiles. So that's what it's suggested in the, in the commentaries, that this centurion was a member of Herod's army. Now the centurion had a servant who he, he valued and was about to die. So as Jesus entered Capernaum, Capernaum is the scene of many of his early miracles, the centurion, centurion hears about his arrival. So first of all, here we have a man of compassion. Wasn't uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, compassion wasn't always there for servants. They were easily bought, easily sold, and um, if they got injured, well, we'll buy a new one. But here we have a man of, because he's a God-fearer, we have a man of compassion. And because of that, the centurion sent some of the, elder, the Jewish elders to ask Jesus to come and heal him. Now, notice the difference between the Jewish elders there and those in Jerusalem. Those in Jerusalem couldn't wait to, to, get a, to, to find a basis of a charge for him, to have him killed. But here in Capernaum, the scene of all his early miracles, they revere Jesus. It seems they, they hold him in esteem. And do you notice the difference between what the elders say about the centurion and what the, how the centurion sees himself? Yes, um, this man has asked the, these elders to help him. To, to beg his help, but they say this man deserves to have you do this. He loves our nation, has built our synagogue. Now these are worthy things, and to build a synagogue won't be cheap. So here, so he must have been a man with some means, but he was prepared to use it for God's glory. There's a challenge for us, isn't it? Do we, are we, do we use what we have? For God's glory? It's a challenge to take home, isn't it? Yeah. Or would we rather keep it ourselves? I wonder. But look what the man says about himself. When Jesus was near the house, he sent some friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I don't deserve to have you under my roof. He knows he's not worthy. He's a man <coughs> under authority with with authority, with soldiers under his command, people, soldiers, and servants he gives command to. And they do what he tells them, but he says, Lord, not me, Lord, don't trouble it. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. This man, who is a person with authority, calls Jesus Lord. And he realises he is unworthy to have Jesus under his roof. A large part of this, of course, is the fact he knows he's a Gentile. He knows what that means. He, he knows his own disadvantage, his own inadequacy. But he knows, thirdly, that Jesus can heal his servant, even from a distance, with just a word. And he says Jesus was amazed at him. He says, I've never found such faith, even in Israel. And that's a dramatic thing, really, for Jesus to say that this Gentile has shown greater faith in Jesus than all the Jews he's come across. Jesus often talks about faith, doesn't he? If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move that mountain. Or to his disciples in the boat, oh, you of little faith. But Jesus announced that this Gentile has more faith than anyone he's found in all Israel. And because of his faith, his servant was healed at that moment. So what do we learn from this? Well, the true church crosses all boundaries of class, race, gender, denomination. 
as long as we hold to the truth of God's word. It doesn't mean anything goes. We must hold firm to God's word. The centurion in this passage sets as a great example of faith. And Jesus was amazed by his faith. Hebrews chapter 11, the writer speaks about men of faith in the Old Testament. Some of the names we're very familiar with, very old names. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and there's many others. And these great men of faith, not only did they believe, but because they believed, it led them to action. We started talking earlier about Wesley and bit by bit, and Whitfield, bit by bit, their mis- ministry started crossing denominational lines. It wasn't easy for people, somebody like John Wesley. His upbringing, by, his high church upbringing, it would have been drummed into him by his father that the only true church was the Anglican church. But bit by bit, the gospel message was, his message crossed, the revival crossed denominational lines and it became known as a great awakening and it changed the face of both Britain and America. And because people believed, they started taking action because of that belief. Many of today's charities and much of the framework we have for helping the poor started in the years of the awakening or shortly afterwards as people started reading the scriptures for themselves, as people started coming alive with the gospel. So in closing, we've looked at Wesley and them, but this is our time. The men of faith, men and women of faith that are in Hebrews 11, along with the apostles, have moved on to glory. So of Wesley and, Wesley and Whitfield. But what about us? Are we men and women cut from the same cloth as those that have gone before? Believers and doers. And my question in closing is this. Is the world a better place because we're in it? Because of our faith. Amen.